Hey everyone, it is Monday. Yes, it is Monday, Memorial Day, but our expert series continues. We don't take any days off uh, and we are welcoming Greg Dickerson back to the show, which if you do not recall, he has served in our armed forces and we owe him a lot. So welcome to the show, Greg. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, Michael. Uh, glad to be here today on Memorial Day, May 25th of 2020. Yeah. So do me a favor, as a veteran, why don't you kind of lay out for the folks like myself who haven't served, what does Memorial Day mean to you, maybe in comparison and likes to, to Veterans Day, just real quick. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people know this, but some may not know the difference. So Memorial Day is all about people who have fallen in the line of duty serving this country. So it's mm -hmm. about the fallen heroes. Veterans Day is about anybody who has or is serving, right? So you're just a veteran. So you're just celebrating those who have and did serve. And like you say, you know, you mentioned you owe me a debt of gratitude. Nobody owes me anything. Who we owe are the people that are that are dead and that gave their lives for this country. For everybody who wants to complain about wearing a mask, everybody who complains about it, everybody who's shut down, whatever. You have the right to have your opinion and to live free and make your choices and do whatever you want to do, whether you like it or not, complain or not, good or bad, because people are out there willing to give up their life. And when you join the military, you take an oath to, to serve the country, to defend the Constitution with your life. So when you sign up, it's not a flippant thing. You know that you're being called to give your life in the event uh, of a situation that calls for that. So every one of us who serve realize that. So I served right out of high school. Everybody in my family were all military. My grandfather was a Pearl Harbor survivor. My dad was a 20 year man. I just did four years. So, I mean, I just did what was culture in my family. Every male in my family served in the military. They all served right out of high school. All, you know, just blue collar, salt of the earth, you know, um, workers, you know, when they went in, my dad came out an officer. He went in and enlisted, came out an officer as a warrant officer, you know, but I just did my four years, got out and then I went and started my career. But if, there was a call to arms today. And if this country needed people to go serve today to fight and die for this country so that you could live free and everybody else watching this could live free, I would be there in a heartbeat. I made that commitment once and that commitment, even though I only served four years, is for life. You know, I will defend to the death this country and everything it stands for at any given time if called upon. So when you've served, you kind of take that oath and you're kind of ready at any time to go back and to be called back and you can be called back. So <laughs> anyways, Enough of that, but that's what Memorial Day is uh, all about. It's all about the fallen, those who gave their lives, the ultimate sacrifice for this country, for our freedoms, for our right to do whatever we want to do. And uh, Veterans Day is just everybody who served. Yeah. Yeah, it, there's, there's a great quote out there. I wish I knew who gets credit for it, but it, you know, um, all gave some, some gave all. Right. Mm -hmm. Memorial Day is for the ones that gave all. Right. Yeah. That, that lost their lives. You know, the military was a great thing for business. You, you know, so I was in retail in the military, I was in the Navy on ships and I took care of the ship stores and vending machines and we did the barber shops and laundry and all that. So I took, you know, accounting, business training, retail. Mm -hmm. And what, other than that, what really parlays well into the real world, the civilian world afterwards, especially for me, I'm just a natural born entrepreneur. I always knew that's the route I was going to take. So leadership, discipline, you know, standard operating procedures, which is systems, you know, Navy is all about standing operated operating procedure, you know, preventative maintenance systems. I mean, the Navy's all about redundancy systems and chain of command. And it's all about serving, you know, so back in the day when I went in and people before me, it was more, you know, um, it was more lead with an iron fist and, you know, fear and intimidation and just follow orders or people die. You know, that was the military <laughs> that I came up in. It has changed a little bit now to where it's more about what the military is, service, serving your country, serving others, leadership, is about serving. And I had some great leaders, you know, my, my commanding officers, I was very fortunate. I had some really good commanding officers, but there were some in leadership and in power that aren't, that weren't so great. And, you know, that took advantage of that and abused power a little bit. But I think these days people are recognizing and realizing it's more about service. So, so those are some of the qualities that really benefited me in my life, you know, being organized, attention to detail. Military is all about attention to detail. You hear that over and over and over. It's all about executing, right? Ideas are great, but it's in the execution. That's, that's really where the rubber meets the road. Redundancies, plans of action, state, you know, systems, operating procedures, you know, all those things. So that's just a little bit of what you gain from time in the military that really has helped me in my business career. Very, very cool. Well, Greg, do me a favor. Your microphone is just catching the edge of your polo shirt a little bit and we're getting a little scratchy on it. So just to be uh, yeah. it, just there you go. That, that'll be good. Yeah, I hate that. Yeah, that's all right. So, hey, uh, um, let's flip gears a little bit and really talk about what we're seeing, right? We've been in this now, 
I don't know, let's call it 10 weeks. And I think it's time where the experienced folks can start to see a bifurcation of what's going on. And for me, rightly or wrongly, I'm starting to see pretty big divide between what's going on with what I'll call the owner occupant or residential market. And then what I see stress and pain going in the commercial market. And I'll turn it over to you in a sec, but just mm -hmm. to start here, I think the residential side, uh, meaning, you know, single family homes, you know, unemployment, consumers, right? That set of folks, which I play in a lot. Right now, it's kind of an artificial world, right? We have in, enhanced unemployment. We have uh, forbearance, which is taking care of the expense side of the income statement for lots of folks if you need it. And it's kind of, it, it really is a pause button for most folks, right? They're buying time. But then I go over and look at the commercial sector, which again, I have not looked at any, any great detail for the last 20 years, but I have been looking at it the last 10 weeks. And what I see is a lot of, I see a champagne bottle where the, where it's, the pressure is building. And I think that side's going to pop first, right? The REITs, office buildings, you know, threats of, you know, uh, not only vacancies, but the strong tenants want lower rates. And it's just, I guess I'm most nervous about the commercial side. And I wanted to come to a guy like you who plays there. Am I just a naive newcomer who doesn't get it? Or what, what do you see on those two sides? Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's really interesting when you go back to 2009 and 10, it was the housing market that died in the tank. And that commercial market was on the precipice, but the banks didn't let that shoe drop. That was a right. big one that was in trouble, in distress, and had issues, but the banks did not let that one fail. So, yep. so they kind of worked that one through, propped that up. I mean, there was a little bit like, you know, from a developer standpoint, there were, you know, subdivision loans that were getting yeah. called due, you know, things like that. Um, the housing market in most areas of the country that were healthy and strong before this are still healthy and strong. There's less inventory overall, as we know, people yeah. pulled their houses off the market. So it's making it even tougher. The interesting thing that's going to happen in the residential housing market to watch is two things. One, um, as you know, cities. So there's a lot of the work at home thing. Yeah. So like all of the, you know, Silicon Valley companies are allowing people to, to move, yep. leave the city. Some people are doing that work from home. We're seeing that in New York. You're going to see it in LA. So you can have a little bit. I don't know it's going to be enough to make a dent. These are great iconic cities that have, have always withstood any disaster. This is different. So there'll be a little bit of, of flux there. So I don't know what the real effect on the housing market is going to be there. Um, you'll just have to see short-term rentals. So short-term rentals, specifically vacation rentals, um, as we know, has been obliterated you know, during mm -hmm. all this because the most of them were just completely shut down. That's the market that I started in the business in. I was in a mm -hmm. resort uh, vacation market, short-term rentals. So that's what I was doing, building and selling those, buying and renovating them. So I owned at any given time, you know, uh, 10 to 15, sometimes $20 million worth of these things that I was wow. building and selling, multi-million dollar, you know, vacation rental homes. That's, that's what I did. And, um, you know, in the early part of my career, before I got into commercial multifamily, uh, so that market, especially where I came from, it'll be really interesting to see how does that look moving forward. And the beaches all just reopened this week down there for visitors and Memorial weekend. So I'm real curious to catch up with some people and see what the occupancies look like, you know, what, what the traffic look like and what it, what the summer is going to look like. And then, you know, how all this goes. So those are the things to watch in residential big city exodus, um, vacation rental markets, you know, how does mm -hmm. that work through? And, um, and where are the opportunities there? I think, you know, that, that may be a little bit of, of distress there. You flip to the commercial side, huge distress, mm -hmm. huge distress. And what the Fed has done and is, in do, is doing is propping up the banks and the funds that are holding that paper, okay? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, those assets are going to, they're going to get let go. So if it's a REIT that owns them, if it's a fund that owns them, if it's an investor that owns them, let's just take a huge shopping mall and now all of a sudden you've lost, you know, 70% of your tenants or some of your anchor, to anchor tenants, that's going to trigger co-tenancy clauses in your lease mm -hmm. that, that say as a retailer, let's say you have the gap store, there's a co-tenancy clause that says if you lose an anchor or a certain percentage of your tenant center goes dark, that's getting triggered all over the place and, and all over the country. And these malls are just basically trying to figure out, man, what do we do? Now, again, this is all hyper local. Some markets and some malls are very healthy still. Back to them. Other areas, um, I made a video of my local mall the other day that's been, you know, the mall in our area. That thing's dying before this all happened. And now it's just a ghost town. 
Wow. So, you know, there's a lot of this, a lot of these retail and office assets out there that now are vacant and are not going to come back to life. Company after company is going bankrupt right now between JC Penney and, you know, all of the you know, Forever yeah. 21 the Gap, all these companies that started before this. Now it's, <laughs> it's more and more and more. So there's a big shoe that is yet to drop in that, that commercial market that, that could be a big problem for the banks this time around. Yeah. And that's where this all leads to me. Again, my experience through the last crash is, is, Again, as a resident, the thing that became very common for the individual owner of a house was ultimately something called a strategic default, right? That mm -hmm. became the buzzword. Yeah. Right? Once, once you got over the stigma, which was like the first six or nine months of losing your house or doing a short sale, which there was a little of that, but once the, mo once the dominoes got to like month eight or nine and everybody was doing it, people were bragging about strategic defaults. And then ultimately where that became a problem is the banks suffered, right? They, they, they just, they had so much inventory. I mean, I did a video on a property that I, I ended up buying for 40 grand that last sold for 200, right? And it just had price drop after price drop after price drop after price drop. Um, so now if I flash forward to a commercial, what I've been reading about is I see the same pain, not, not, not the same volume, right? Cause there's just more residential stuff but the dollar amounts are freaking amazing, right? I, there was one fund talking about a billion dollars in special servicing already, which means yeah. they've already defaulted. But you know, a billion dollars is like 43 properties. I'm like, I yeah. can't even fathom how big these things are gonna be. Oh, it's hundreds of billions. And so here's what's gonna happen. And here's, here's what happened last time. So in the housing market, these, you know, just so people understand, you know, securities were created uh, with, with, you know, bad mortgages, you know, um, mm toxic mortgages that were cut up and sold to securities on Wall Street. So the big banks that created these derivatives that took, you know, 10 houses in 10 different cities and carved them up into 10 different pieces and packaged those together as a security, a stock, and then sold it, you know, on, on Wall Street, on the stock market, you know, that's kind of what the, the mortgage-backed security uh, market was like um, in the residential sector, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was happening was they were taking, uh, you know, taking these um, loans um, that were, gosh, what's the term I'm, I'm trying to think of people that couldn't qualify for a loan, um, uh, subpar, uh, subprime, you know, subprime, subprime, subprime. So subprime loans, that was a big part of that market. That was people that didn't have the down payment, couldn't mm -hmm. qualify for a loan that were getting put into the market I was in, you know, I was building multi-million dollar yeah. houses. I shouldn't have been able to have 20 of those. Right. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that's what was going on. So yeah. those were getting carved up into pieces, sold off the security. So what happened was when that thing went default and defunct and that whole thing started exploding, Okay, everything got written down mark to market. In other words, as an owner, let's say you have 10 properties, you're carrying those properties on your balance sheet as net worth of being worth X, according to today's market value. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the market shifted, all those banks were still carrying those assets on their books at pre-2009 market value. So what happened was they were forced to mark to market, reduce those things down. Now they became worthless. They were negative overnight. Yeah. So here's the, here's the kicker. And this is what's going on behind the scenes right now that you're not hearing about, but you will. So the same banks that created these derivatives, you know, Black, Blackstone, Black, you know, Black Blackstone, Rock, Rock, you know, Rock. Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. Lehman Brothers, you know, these big banks, okay, Bank of America, were creating these der derivatives. They were also rating these things. Yeah. They're rating it. It's kind of like you as an investor owning the appraisal company that appraises your properties and then owning the bank that finances them. That's what oh, was yeah. going on. So these companies that created these derivatives sold them as AAA rated when they knew they were junk, cashed in on that. Uh, then they, in turn, when all these foreclosures happened and the banks were writing down these assets, turned around and bought them back for pennies on the dollar. And now they rent them out yeah. and they own them and they're, they're renting them out as rental property. So they have yeah. these huge portfolios they picked up for pennies on the dollar. Yeah. Same thing is going to happen in commercial because these, you know, now they got paid too. So the banks got made whole on, on all those assets that, that got written down. The government came in, brought up, gave them all this money, written down. They got made whole by the government. Then they ended up buying them back for pennies on the dollar. And now, you know, they have all these properties. So commercial is the same kind of thing. You've got all these assets that are going into default. And there's all this bad paper out there. So what's going to happen and what's happening is the government's going to come in. They're going to loan money to these banks to make them whole on the losses. And then these big funds are going to come back in and buy these things up, these toxic assets for pennies on the dollar. Then they're going to work through them. 
So I think that's kind of what you're going to see going on behind the scenes with, with a lot of these things. So it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. And then, so when I look at, again, right, I, I'm the naive person here, the rookie and the commercial side. First thing I think about is, okay, how can I participate, right? Are, are, is there going to be any opportunities for me to buy assets at a reduced price? And honestly, I think these numbers are so big uh, that, you know, my checkbook's not deep enough. So that's the first mm -hmm. thing I think about. I go, okay, great. Missed that opportunity. And then I think about, okay, what's the ripple effect up into the bank? Because residential and commercial ultimately ends up in the same financial institution. Is there going to be enough pain on the commercial side that ultimately impacts the bank, which means the bank has to raise fees or raise interest rates or risk premiums or whatever that ultimately impacts my residential side? Yeah. And I think my answer is yes, which means my interest rates are going to go up, my fees are going to go up. Uh, and then again, all of that impacts the value of real estate, uh, re the residential side. I don't know. Do you see the same daisy chain or, or no? Yeah. So it depends on the bank and what they're holding and their ability to get rid of that paper. So mm -hmm. the first thing they're going to try to do is sell that, sell that paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if they have commercial assets that are, that are in distress and their residential side is doing well, you know, they, they can, they can loan based on their deposits and they mm -hmm. can loan based on their balance sheet. So if they're forced to mark to market as things change, if they have properties in distress, they're losing value, they're going to have to write that down. And when they do, that's going to create a problem. So the first thing they try to do is get rid of that paper. So that's already happening with local banks. So I've got mm -hmm. people I'm working with, um, you know, I work with people all over the country and I've got, you know, one of my clients right now I'm working with, they got a call last week about a medical office building that was in distress and the owner was about ready to go into foreclosure. The bank called him and said, Hey man, you want to buy this? So with your local and regional, regional banks, where the opportunities are for the average players and the smaller players um, are, are at the local and regional level, level, like you're talking about, the special assets manager. That's at your local and regional banks. That's who's handling stuff that's going into default, forbearance, um, modifications, you know, things like that. So loan forbearances, hey, you don't have to make your payments. And then at a, at a point, they all come due. And then if you can't, then there's what's called modification. So, you know, those special assets, people are the ones that take over those situations. Then you have your REO department, real estate owned. That's properties that have gone through the foreclosure process that the bank now owns and they have on their books. So those are the two departments you want to stay in touch with. And you just want to let them know, hey, you know, I'm liquid. I'm ready to go. Um, let me know if you need some loans taken over. I'm happy to step in and take them over. Let me know if you have some stuff that you're ready to just peel off your books and, you know, I can come in and cash them out. So those are your two opportunities with your special assets. You'll have an opportunity to come in and take those loans over. The bank will finance you, maybe give you a year or two to work through it and get a refinance, but you can just walk right into them with no money out of your pocket on certain assets. Then you have the foreclosures that you can walk in uh, that the bank owns those, depending on what they are, commercial and, and stuff like that, they're going to be writing those down. Residential, they didn't do that so much because the residential market's hot and they're going to try to get as much money as they can, which they have to, you know, they, they are, uh, you know, um, subject to the regulators. Um, so the, you know, the federal regulators, you know, they're like, look, you can't just dump stuff. You gotta, you gotta get at least market value, appraised value for these things, uh, or close to it, or they have to be listed at appraised value, market value first before they can dump them for whatever. So there's a process they have to go through, but when they're distressed before they reach that position, they have more flexibility. So special assets is a great place for somebody like you and people that may be listening, you know, that, that can't play in the big arena and, you know, with these huge assets, which you don't want to anyways. I mean, you know, the big malls and things like that, you know, that, that's, that's a different conversation and it'll be interesting to see where those things go. But there's a lot of REITs may not make it through this cycle. Uh, there's a lot of investment funds that are, that are, you know, owning those assets that may not make it. And there's a lot of, you know, private owners as well that are going to be in some serious trouble. So it'll be interesting to see how those go. Yeah. What, what is happening in some of the REIT, the section of the, the you know, the REIT market is, um, I mean, I've never seen anything like it, right? When, when I had a 401k, which I haven't since I quit uh, working, um, my entire 401k was in REIT stocks. I'm glad I, I'm glad I got out what I did because there are a lot of REITs trading at 70, 70, per, you know, 70 percent drops, and some of them I'm afraid. Um, I think some REITs are going to go. I think some REITs are going to go to zero. I just don't know how yeah. they, how they survive given their assets that they bought and financed are not worth nearly what they paid for. Yeah, they'll have to unwind, liquidate, and close the fund. You know, so uh, I think we're going to see that 
and some retail REITs, um, some of the shopping mall REITs. Now, most of them own some things, but there are some that are just straight up retail. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're going to have a difficult time surviving. So uh, it'll be interesting times to watch those. Yeah, I think, I think there's a whole bunch of, if your REIT is focused, which used to be seen as a good thing, now is a bad thing if you are focused on assets that rely on crowds, right? Yeah. Retail, office. There's, there's a couple of REITs out there that are uh, focused on, um, I don't know what to call them, sports venues or concert venues, right? The big, you know, yeah. $20,000. Arenas. State. Yeah. Arenas, Event thank you. Arenas. I'm like, ooh, yeah. can you imagine a worst? <laughs> I'm not sure I can imagine a worst asset today, right? The Chase mm. Center where, where I watch the Warriors play. Uh, it's, been, it's been vacant and will likely be vacant for probably almost a calendar year. I mean, God, they just built that so, for a billion you know, here's the thing about all that. You know, and again, the Fed is stepping up the way they're stepping up for a reason, and they're buying anything. I mean, yeah. now's the time to do you know, whatever, because the Fed's just, man, they're buying whatever, you know? That's right. They Bring it on! Become, <laughs> they might become the biggest REIT in the world, you know, uh, through all this. And, that, you know, you might see them buying up real estate. That's the other oh, that's side true. of that play. If they can't get Wall Street to play ball, which in the commercial market of retail and office, I'm not so sure there's going to be a lot of people stepping up for a lot of those assets the government may very well step in and just buy these properties wow. and have a special thing that they've created to own real assets like this, you know, or at least the paper on them until, until something else can be done. So it'll be interesting to see what really transpires there. But yeah, um, and real, real quick on that. Was, isn't that similar to what they did during the savings and loans crisis? Not to just totally change gears, but the, the yeah, government, they took over the banks. Yeah. Right. Which ultimately meant at least for a little while, I think it was in the seventies or the eighties the SNL crisis, the bank had a special, I don't know what they call it, a special asset division or whatever it was, where they were the physical owner and operator of lots of real estate, right? So this wouldn't right. be the first time. Yeah, it was a nightmare. They wiped out the banks, you know, so that, yeah. that's, that destroyed our system as we know it back then. So that was before my time. I wouldn't even, you know, I was middle school, you know, when that was going down. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but you know, it's interesting times. So, you know, again, how do you position yourself? So there's two things going on here. There's one, that, you know, there's going to be a short sale market. So a lot of people that did, didn't participate in 2009 on, you know, maybe don't, don't quite understand short sales. And, and, you know, we learned a lot from that time about short sales and how to do that. So there'll be some short sale opportunities, residential and commercial, which that's kind of where on the commercial side, local and regional banks have the, have the flexibility to be able to do different deals on a short sale versus like the residential mortgage market, right? So that's a more traditional process that has to take place and for a short sale to take place what that means is you're selling the property for less than what's owed on it that's what a short sale is so there's two people that have to agree number one it's the owner so even though you're in default or whatever you know you still have control of that property as the owner title holder so um, the property the rules are a property has to be on market at appraised value for a certain period of time generally before the, uh, they can you know before the bank will accept a short sale offer so if you've been on the market, whatever that time frame is, and you want to talk to your bank, find out what's going on there uh, at the appraised value, and you start getting offers, it's up to the owner to accept that offer, send mm -hmm. it to the bank, and the bank looks at it, decides whether or not they're going to agree on that contract, and then it starts going into the closing process. And then when that short sale is done, uh, if it sells for less than what's owed, they look at that, that creates a deficiency, then the bank decides, do we go after the borrower? Do we forgive that? And if it's forgiven, that can be a taxable event. Mm -hmm. Now, back in 2009 and 10, they wiped that off the books where they, you know, said if people were insolvent at the time, they got rid of that. And I think right now they're going to also, yeah. I think they're not waiving uh, deficiency, um, you know, taxation as well. So, you know, that, that's a good thing. So, they, you know, that's kind of how, the, how a short sale works in a quick nutshell, but they can be very good, but they take time. They, they're yeah. usually very slow, a lot of paperwork, and there's a specific process and every lender is different. They created these platforms. We had to upload documents. And sometimes I remember. you had to do it four and five times. Yeah, it was just crazy. Yeah. Yeah, the, the other thing that I think is important for folks to remember, and again, we've been in this thing 10 weeks. It's far faster and deeper than anything either of us have ever been through. But the short sale and REO crisis, it unwound, again, very residential focused for two to four to five years, right? There were some states yeah. like New York and uh, Florida, I think, or judicial states, who still mm -hmm. had bad debt from the 08 crisis on their books in 2020, right? It's, it's, um, yeah, yeah. It's the a whole long process. Shadow inventory. So a lot of banks, you know, they didn't want to flood the market and really tank the real estate market. So, you know, banks aren't stupid. So a lot of people think, oh man, these foreclosures, I'm going to get the steal of a lifetime. You know, banks aren't, aren't, aren't the dumb guys, right? So mm -hmm. 
you know, they were holding off on that shadow inventory and releasing it slowly. And then same thing happened with a lot of these, you know, investment funds. I think it was Blackstone mm -hmm. um, is one of, the, one of the big buyers that came in and just bought, you know, uh, billions and hundreds of billions of dollars worth of these toxic assets yep. off of, you know, um, off of the, the banks mm -hmm. that had them. And then they turned around and did the same thing. Some they kept and they rented it out. Some they just released slowly and sold and, you know, and they made their money. And that's when that whole model shifted to where some of these funds now are, are owning these houses because we have shifted to a rental society in a lot of ways. So there's, there's whole subdivisions that are just rental subdivisions that are being developed and that were bought out and things like that. So yeah. um, it's, it's really, really interesting times. And, and we still just don't even know. I mean, we're starting to open up now. This is the first big week where pretty much the whole country's open. Everybody's back out there. So over the next two to three weeks, you know, depending on what the results are of all this, will give us a really good indication of what the future looks like. So hopefully we won't see a resurgence. We won't see this huge, you know, wave, you know, hit us again. And we'll be able to get, get through this thing and continue on the path of reopening. But I think we've seen, and what we're seeing is the general public still is not comfortable getting out there in mass like they were before which is kind of what you and I have been talking about all along when this first started, we were talking about from day one, 12 to 18 months before we recover. Mm -hmm. Now I think you can say it's 18 to 24 months before oh. you see any kind of a, yeah, you know, for sure. For sure. 80%, you know, GDP where we were before all this started. Oh. And, you know, people, you know, people are, uh, a lot of people are concerned. Yeah. The consumer psychology has changed. This was always my question. Is this going to be the event of my lifetime that changes consumer psychology? And I think it is. Uh, it's still early to tell, right? We're 10 weeks in, you know, who knows? Tomorrow we get an announcement that there's a vaccine in the world. You know, everything's good all of a sudden. But I think this is going to go on longer than we want. It's going to be a slower road back. We're going to have double digit un unemployment. We also are going to have, I just noted this morning, people are savings more, right? And again, when, like in Europe, that was the first number I found. An average month in the five biggest banks in Europe, people would save $3.8 billion. What they saved in March, $20 billion. 5x wow. right if we do that in the u.s our economy is not going to grow right when we take that wow. much currency out of the out of the economy mm -hmm. it, it's it's going to slow down for sure it will not come back fast well, we talked about that i mean you're going to have that cap and fever spending you're going to have that revenge spending where people yeah. are gonna be like i've been cooped up i'm going to get out and then they're going to pull back because you know they've, a lot of people have gone through the reserves have gone through their savings and they need to rebuild that yeah. So, you know, especially now when they know anything can and will happen at any time at the drop of a hat. So, you know, and, and again, that's only about 30% of, of the workforce. So it's not everybody, you know, it's mm -hmm. only about 30 to 40%. And unfortunately it is, you know, as we've seen, it's the retail worker and the hospitality worker. And, yeah, you know, those, those types of industries, you know, didn't affect at, at large scale, you know, construction and essential services and things like that. It's a very, you know, small portion of the population, but a big portion of the economy, which is interesting, yeah. you know, that, that was affected. And even the shopping, I was talking to my wife this morning, you know, just about habits in general. She's like, everybody's laying around in their pajamas, you know, there's nothing yeah. to shop for, you know, it's like women. She's, she's like, you know, normally women are out shopping right now, getting ready for the summer and reopen, you know what I mean? Yeah. New outfits, new bathing suits. Nobody's doing that, you know, cause yeah. they're like, we're not going anywhere. I'm laying around the house, you know, so what, what's to shop for? Yeah. Let's just wait till the fall. <laughs> yeah. Know, pretty now, crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting how this has affected just so many different things. Yeah, again, it's again, I track I track consumer and cost of capital. I think the consumer psychology is changing. Uh, I do think we're going to become a renter nation. I think space is going to become important. Hence, apartments might be a problem. And then cost of capital. I keep going back. Is the pain on commercial going to be enough? And it won't happen this year, right? The Fed mm -hmm. the Fed is open, but will it impact 2021, 2022? where maybe we get used to 3% mortgage rates and all of a sudden they're four and a half. That's where I, I just don't know. I, it's these, these dominoes, it, 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 they all could tie together in a big bow in, in 2022 and be, be interesting to watch. Yeah, it's a lot. And you know, the saving grace right now is fuel is very cheap. So as, yeah. as we open back up and we get back to work, what happens there? Because you know, that's a tax. So as, yeah. stu as soon as, you know, fuel starts to rebound and rise, you know, and starts digging into people's wallets. I mean, if you're one of those, you know, 15 to $20 an hour workers, you know, a dollar a gallon makes a huge difference in your budget, you know? So, uh, and I mean, I remember when gas was, you know, in my area hitting four bucks when it's normally around two. Yeah. I mean, people fundamentally changed the way they did things. I mean, people were buying cars, 
because of that that were more fuel efficient. It made more sense. Yeah. You were spending that much money on gas and people were stopping eating out, stopping going to the movies. It made a big you know, impact. So those are the things you got to watch. And again, there's a lot of discussion about inflation. You know, mm-hmm. is there going to be for inflation? What is this going to look like? And, and again, the inflation you're going to see are going to be in assets. They're going to be in equities. They're going to be in, you know, precious metals, so, you know, oil, Bitcoin, you know, all these things that the money is going to where the Fed and the government has really messed up and hasn't helped is the money is not reaching Main Street, small business Americans, right? If everybody in this country were made whole on the salary they lost, and the businesses were made whole on the revenues they lost, then there might be a different situation about, you know, when it comes to inflation and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's just the banks, you know, which, you know, the stock market is important. That's a lot of people's retirement, right? So that, mm-hmm. that is important. Um, so, so you gotta, you gotta keep that going. Cause if you lose, if the stock market starts tanking and confidence is lost there, then that, you know, mm-hmm. that reverberates to the banking system. Then you get economic Armageddon, you get financial collapse, which is what they were facing in 2008 and nine. So they know now what they need to do. And the good news is we do have an unlimited ability. You know, the question is, what does it look like in terms of, you know, inflation down the road? And the, and the way the Fed is putting money out there just isn't going to create inflation in, you know, the retail sector and, you know, just in the general, the general areas that we roll in. But it is propping up Wall Street. It's going to keep that inflated until a time when that liquidity has to get sucked back out. And that's when you're going to see the big event there. Yeah. Yeah, lots of stuff going on. Um, any closing thoughts as we wrap up today's interview? Yeah, so I think it's all good and encouraging. You know, uh, there's news on the front every day that we're closer and closer to a vaccine, closer and closer to treatments, more testing, you know, all of these things that we need to get through this and to the other side. So there's great hope and optimism there. Uh, the key is, you know, we'll see what's going on here in the next, you know, few weeks uh, in terms of what, you know, what the results of opening up look like. And then the opportunities are going to be, you know, like I said, in those areas of the residential housing market, the short-term rentals, and, you know, there's going to be some distress there um, with, you know, because the forbearance is only going to get people so far. Mm-hmm. That money is going to be due at some point. And yep. for investment properties, if you had a balance sheet, when you got that loan, the banks aren't going to be so forgiving and say, look, you, know, you said you had a hundred grand when you bought this house, where's it at? Yeah. You know, and, and they're going to look at your expenses and say, you know, I understand, you know, you didn't lose your job. You didn't, you know, you need to pay the mortgage. You had the money coming in, you had the reserves. So, you know, there's gonna be a lot of stuff that that they're not going to be, uh, you know, doing loan modifications for and people are going to be forced to sell some of these properties. Uh, Hopefully all that'll come back and we won't see any of that, but there's going to be some of that. And then there's going to be the office and retail sector. And, you know, what do you do with those? You know, so I'll tell you a niche and I'll just give you a little niche here for a lot of people to keep an eye out for Mm -hmm. where you can get the best deals right now and get the best upside potential is small, um, hotels, you know, like the little garden style, two-story hotels, walk up, exterior entry type uh, product and turning those into micro apartments. Depending on location, there's a huge niche for that where you can turn them into studios, one bedrooms, you know, by connecting units. Mm -hmm. Um, That's where you can buy, you'll be able to buy those things, serious distress, get them for pennies on the dollar, turn them around, renovate them and convert them into micro apartments and just make a huge, huge uh, margin on those. So that's, that's a good little niche. Keep your eyes out for it. I will be looking into that. Absolutely. Well, Greg, thank you very much for doing this, uh, talking on Memorial day again, always appreciate it. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for everybody who's watching that, you know, has served and, you know, if you've lost somebody, uh, serving, you know, that's what today's all about. And our thoughts and prayers are with all of you. And we just thank everybody for their service and their sacrifice. Yeah. Real quick, plug your YouTube channel. You're doing lots of great content there. Where, where should people go? Oh yeah. Greg Dickerson. So just, you know, the Greg Dickerson, uh, YouTube channel that's on there and, and I'm all over, you know, all the social media, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, all that. So yeah. Very, very cool. Thank you very, thank you very much, buddy. Yeah. Awesome.